When it comes to processing grief, we all approach it very differently. Uh, there are so many things that we can grieve in life, whether it's loss of a loved one, the loss of who we expected to be, all of our unmet expectations, they play a major role in shaping our sorrows, our sadnesses, our uh, missed expectations that uh, leave us feeling um, really you know, up the hill uh, or up this creek without a paddle. We don't know what to do, and uh, it can be hard to get back. That's why I'm excited to be joined today by Chuck and Ashley Elliott, who have uh, co-written a book called I Used to Be Blank. Uh, we can fill in the blank there. How to Navigate Large and Small Losses in Life and Find Your Path Forward. It's a great resource, one that I have been contemplating for a while now and thinking through, especially as we do ministry post pandemic and dealing with people who are going through all of these issues, it does seem to be a subject that we as the church ought to be addressing uh, very confidently with an answer to those questions. So Chuck, Ashley, thank you for being a part of the many voices for that one message. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. We're excited to be here. It's an honor. Yeah, for sure. Why don't you get us started by telling us a little bit about yourselves. You're a couple, you're married, mm -hmm. and uh, over in this book, and it's come out of your own experiences in a lot of ways. In fact, I feel like you can't possibly write a book like this without having been through it, been through the the sort of turmoil for yourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Through the pain that we've experienced um, in various different ways, we recognized how grief flows in and out of our lives, and that helped us to develop the content to help other people when their life has changed and their identity has been shaken. They've lost somebody or something they really love. Yeah, and Chuck and I faced recurrent miscarriage, and that was maybe the, the main thing that categorized up us as personal grief experts. But then as we looked at our life, we were like, oh, we've actually encountered other things that really are grief. We just didn't maybe use that term. So for me, you know, just an experience that I tell about in the book that is not fun to talk about. It's it's hard to write about, but it's even harder to talk about. But I lost one of the first jobs that I had in my first degree level job. And that was a really hard experience. And so at, after we'd experienced the grief, and then we were really kind of focusing broadly, we saw there are so many different large and small things that we should grieve that we oftentimes bury. And as we looked at the process that we went through to heal with miscarriage, we could apply it to the different types of grief as well, which was super, super helpful for us. Yeah, I think that's so important. What you just said is that we often bury our grief uh, as though we could just kind of hide it under the rug and it won't. we won't have to address it and we won't have to deal with it. Uh, you do that with enough grief over time, it uh, starts to rear its ugly head. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ashley and I have been involved in church um, our whole marriage. Ashley grew up in the church. I became a Christian when I was like my first semester in college, so I didn't have quite as much of a track record with it. But we've experienced a lot of losses and some really difficult things within church. Church splits, um, people on staff having an affair, lots of different things. Unfortunately, that it's grief. And I, I grieve that the church is not... I don't know how to say this, um, maybe in a different place because of some of those things that happened. And, and God is faithful. He's sovereign. He's blessed us and taken care of us. And it, it's wonderful to be where we are now. But it definitely has a grief aspect. And in being in church leadership, you experience a lot of losses, your own, and you experience them with other people. And if you don't stop and process that or slow down and process that, that, that at least, you're at risk of burnout. And, and you're going to become callous. You're going to become something that you don't really like. You're not going to be emotionally available. And Ashley and I have, I think, recognized that over the last several years, things things are different. And Chuck, you're sharing from the pastoral side of things, but even as a congregant or someone who's just in the church, there can be so much woundedness that comes from just going to church the first time. And did anybody say hello to me or mm -hmm. were people too much in my face? And so we, we find that we're very picky. We want people to see us, but not tell us what we look like. We, we want them to help, but we don't even know what we need. And so grief is difficult to navigate and just acknowledging that I think can be super helpful. 
It seems that here in New England and the Northeast, a lot of people have had a negative experience with church in some way. I'm, I'm interested that you brought that up because when I'm interacting with people in our community and, and invite them to come to church, they often respond by saying, oh, I, I was hurt by church. I, I, I don't want to go to church. And to which I respond, I was a pastor's kid. Um, I'm a pastor myself. I'm in a nonprofit ministry. I go, oh, yeah, me too. Tell me your story. <laughs> and uh -huh. I can tell you the story. You know, the, the surprise is that uh, a lot of people are hurt in places with friends and family and loved ones. It's often the people that are closest to us that end up hurting us as we're already grieving something that was a painful experience of our own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if we're in the church, we're going to be hurt by people in the church. I don't think that it's a church problem. I think it's a human problem. So acknowledging mm -hmm. that I think is helpful, but I think what you said is perfect. We lean in oh, and listen, too. we listen to people. Tell me what happened. And I've talked to people who are agnostic, they're atheist and their, their pain is valid. And so I say, what if you just lean into what you feel because what you're saying to me sounds painful and sounds like it wasn't right. So I, I love the Lord. And as I hear your story, I think it's right that it doesn't rub with you. I think that that is something that maybe is a holiness inside of you, but don't run from God because of it, run to God and help him or ask, invite him to help you solve that problem. Or what do you do with it from here? And I've seen that work well. I and mean, Ashley saying that to people, if something doesn't feel right, there's a good chance something wasn't right. Maybe it, it was something that you got corrected on or something that didn't line up and it could be an issue um, with you. So we're not denying that. But if something wasn't, that was an opportunity to have a conversation for you to get better or for you to make the church better because we're designed to be a body. So there's something you could contribute and it could be the thing that upset you. Mm. Now the title here is re re really interesting. I used to be blank or fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. um, explain to us the title here because you're not directly addressing one idea of grief. Is mm -hmm. I, I, you're talking about the loss of a loved one. You're talking about a lot of stuff here. I used to be could be many different things. Yeah, I used to be you know, pregnant. I used to be trusted. Those are a couple of the ways that we filled in the blanks. But as we really looked at our own loss and that path forward, which part of our story is we looked to God and we found hope in the Lord that you, he gives us hope no matter what the loss is. And it's re reestablishing that identity in Christ and the fact that we are on a solid rock, though we feel shaky. And so we go to the Lord for help, but we can navigate any of the types of losses in some similar ways, right? There's going to be differences, but if someone has gone through divorce or they've lost a job, whatever that loss is, we are kind of creating this path that they can insert their story into this work. And we use a biblical counseling based approach to give people very practical tools to apply to their situation. There were several times that Ashley and I, had somebody say something to us that really struck us as if they were grieving something, but they didn't identify it as grief. I can tell you that I have a friend who used to be in the in the service, in the military. And one time he told me, I asked him how he was doing in his transition, and he was working a job in civilian life. And I said, well, how, what's it like now? And he says, I miss being important. He was like, I used to be important. Because he used to feel like he was defending our country. He was going overseas. He was doing something that he had great, great meaning attached to. And then when he comes back here, he doesn't feel like he's doing something as important. And his identity had been shaken because he's like, I used to be important. I used to be able to do something that I felt like was making a huge difference. And now I'm just here and I'm working a job. And yes, he loved his family, but he hadn't grieved that loss. Mm. It seems that our identity is really important to us. I mean, I used to be, it's really mm. centered on me. Um, how we see ourselves is very important, and, and that can affect us in many different ways, but it's very different than how God sees us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's a great perspective. And, and thinking about what is it you want from me, God, in this moment? Yes, I don't have this title or this position but what is my identity grounded on? Kind of like what Ashley said, is it grounded on this rock that is stable? And even if I may not be something that I used to be uh, an earthly or a, maybe even sometimes in my case, I can say a selfish title that I wish that I really had, am I grounding myself on my relationship with God? Hmm. Hmm. 
Now, this is a subject I know that you've experienced, and uh, I know that even pastors and and wives, you can find your identity in whatever your title is, and and this can be even a mother or a, a soon to be mother. Ashley, I know that this really centered around your your experience of used to be pregnant. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we have two boys. Or well, first we had two boys, and then we faced three recurrent we, recurrent miscarriages. We faced three miscarriages in a row, and then during that time, we just really struggled at times. And we we still did ministry. We had times that were beautiful, and God moved. But there were some periods of silence that were really, really difficult for me to manage. And what I did during that, I continued serving and I continued seeking the Lord, but it just, it felt much more labor intensive. And I would feel like, God, why are you not close to me? I am running to you and your word says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And rather than being callous or cynical about it, I really tried to hold on that I believe the word is true. And so God, if you tell me that I can draw near to you and you will draw near, then am I missing it? And so then I found this scripture in Job that says the Lord speaks in one way and in two, the man may not perceive it. I said, Lord, maybe I'm not perceiving it. Maybe I'm missing it. Maybe, maybe you are speaking. And so then I would look to scripture and go, well, I know the number one way that you speak is through your word. And so let me look to your word. And I, I found stories of David. I found other stories where people are saying, God, where are you? So I felt less alone there, but then I also knew if I could see the end of these stories and see that God was still faithful, then I, I had to reconcile that within myself saying, God is still faithful, even if I don't get what I want in the moment and, and what I want is good. What I want is God's presence. And so I think there was almost a little bit of an entitlement that I'm like, God, I want your presence. All these people, these Kings, they weren't faithful. They didn't love you, but like, I'm not bowing down to another idol. I'm like, here I am, but with still some sort of entitlement, they like, because I want you, I should have you where I wasn't saying, give me this child back. I felt like I'm praying the right kind of prayer, which is still some sort of sin pride that I'm like running into. And so I said, Lord, if I never get you to speak to me or to give me your word or any comfort, you're still worthy. And so I had this phrase that just kept coming to my mind, like, God, you're worthy before you're worthy before. And that really comforted me. And then God's used that used me to help other people comfort them, you know, with that similar type of thing. And so again, if all that we are to live for is to give God glory, then this pain and suffering that I've gone through, I personally don't think God caused it. Some people said some things that made me feel like, well, God just wanted your baby. And I think that it's the, the result of sin that God doesn't want. God doesn't want most, most of the sin that's in the world. He doesn't want any of the sin, but he wants people to have a godly relationship with him, but he still uses the the brokenness for his glory. Hmm. That kind of brings up the question, is there a right way and is there a wrong way to process or respond to grief? Hmm. Hmm. People put a lot of pressure on themselves when it comes to grieving. I've mm -hmm. had people come in and speak to me at the church and they really just want to know, am I okay? Am I doing this wrong? Because I remember I had um, a man who recently lost his wife. It had just been maybe a week or so. And he was like, do I clean out the closet? Do I get rid of her clothes now? Do I have to do that now? He's like, my, my kids would like me to move closer to them. Do I go ahead and start looking into like selling the house? Like, do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? Am I okay? Am I a horrible person? Because I'm thinking these things are even an option. And I was like, man, you are. You're, you're, you're processing it as, as you need to, and you're okay. Like you're okay that you're having these thoughts, that you're doing those things. People, like I said, put pressure on themselves to feel like they're doing it the right way and the wrong way. Lots of different behaviors can be okay, but we kind of ask, why is it that we're doing it? So if it's for a short period of time, yes, it could be okay that maybe you don't want to go to uh, that function, that party, that gathering. But if you're going to do it for a long-term basis, Ask, why are you doing it? Because you could be avoiding what you really need, which would be relationships. So there's lots of different things that you could be doing when you're grieving, but getting underneath it and saying, what's the, what's the function to it? What is it serving? How is it helping you? What's the good that's in it? Even if it seems like it's a negative thing. 
Ashley and I, we, we talk about in the book, if somebody is going to um, sleep or, or stay in bed for a long time, you know what, if you go through something really difficult, it's, it's reasonable to think that you need to just be in bed for a little bit and you're exhausted and you need to just get rest and withdraw and get some time to yourself. But at what point in time would that be an unhealthy behavior? So just to say that the behavior in itself is wrong, you can't really do that. It's more nuanced than that. Yeah. But it, it's good that we evaluate are some of the things that I'm doing unhealthy so we could make a list of our positive and our negative coping mechanisms. Like, wait, which ones do I think maybe aren't so good? And then pray about this list. Like, Lord, how do I meet these needs in healthier ways? So if I'm turning to alcohol, no, I don't want to turn to alcohol and drink myself silly because I need to deal with my relationships or I still want to work. And if we're turning to a substance, then we're not turning to God and we're trying to use something else to, to fill that hole. So if there are some things that we ourselves think maybe aren't the most helpful, then we can work through that list, seek the Lord, and then try to to find out like what need is being met and meet that in a healthier way. This title of I, I used to be fill in the blank can often be something that causes us to want to cope, doesn't it? Because we don't want to be anything other than what we used to be. We want to stay there. But the progression of time, as well as the development of the spirit is always moving us forward. It's hard for us to leave some of these things behind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that that's natural mm -hmm. and it's okay to grieve it. That does, that isn't sin. It isn't sin to say, mm, I used to be married or I used to be in this relationship or I used to be in the military. It's okay to acknowledge that. And I think sometimes we bury, 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 like I can't deal with it. Just barrel through get busy and people will have sleep trouble. They will lay down at night and they're like, I just can't sleep or I'll fall asleep for two hours and then I'll wake up and I'm miserable. And it's because they didn't give themselves the time to process the grief that they needed to. They kept themselves so busy. They were so good at doing that all week long or all day long. But then when they fall asleep, they get just enough rest to sustain their body and their brain is saying, deal with this issue. It's like this fight or flight you know, emergency that, that our body is sensing, this is super important. And that's because it takes a toll on our physical health. It takes a toll on our mental health. And so if you have a loss or something that you used to be, it's good and healthy to acknowledge that. Now we don't want to just let that rule our lives. We want to submit it to the Lord and say, who am I, Lord? You, de you determine who I am and you knew these things would happen. And so how do I pick up the pieces? How do I navigate my path forward? I'm going to look to you and you're going to help me through it. When it comes to the, the process of navigating this idea of working through all the, there's so many unexpected turns and twists and, and paths and, and crossroads that we can get up to that uh, th this is something that can't be really done in isolation, can it? Mm. Mm, that's a great point. And as Ashley was talking about that just a second ago, and we were answering the question about being aware of what is it that you're doing? And is it unhealthy or healthy? Great way to figure that out is whether or not you're in community. If, if you're in community, you can figure that out. Because if you're not in community, it doesn't seem different that you're withdrawing and staying home for a week solid. But if you're in community, people will notice that. If you're in the body of your local church, which we <laughs> encourage you to, because that's what that's what we're supposed to do as believers, we're supposed to be in community. You'll know that other people care about you and love you, and the lies that grief could be telling you that you're alone and you're alone. The person who's experienced that can be squashed. So, being within the context of community, especially in the church, is how we get better. But um, for Ashley and I, I can tell you that sometimes we didn't even want to be in community because it felt it felt painful like she said earlier well, we want to be seen but we don't want to be told what we look like i want people to know that i'm here and care about me and love me but i don't want them like picking me apart or asking a lot of detailed questions about what it is or who it is that i just lost yeah and i think that so many times we feel overwhelmed by what we feel like we don't want to go out and be around people so with us you know, with especially with large losses it's pretty common for people to socially isolate to say i'm going to stay home but for us, even in that grief, we were still ministry leaders. I still went to work. And rather than physically isolating, I emotionally isolated. So I just pulled back a little bit. I didn't ask people how they were, mostly because 
I didn't feel strong enough to handle the response like I typically would. And so I was just trying to guard and protect myself. And as I've talked to a lot of other people, I see, especially when people are grieving, they physically isolate, they emotionally isolate, and then they're kind of experiencing another struggle of loneliness and distance that they feel. So I think it's helpful for people to know, like, this is kind of a normal process. And then if we apply that to smaller losses, we can then say, Hey, am I doing this? Am I pulling back just a little bit? Because if someone loses their job and someone knew that they had a job interview and they had started this job and they're like, Oh, they're going to ask me, like, I'm just going to not go. They wouldn't have necessarily identified it as grief, but Mm -hmm. they could see that similarity that, Oh, I want to pull back emotionally. I want to pull back physically to protect myself, for protect myself from the pain that might come from the questions of being seen. And so there's so much that we can do, but acknowledging that we need community more now than ever, whenever we're in grief, like that in the grieving state, that's when we need community that will help us. And if we don't, then we're going to likely find ourselves feeling depressed and anxious. So if there's anyone listening who does feel depressed and anxious, and then you look around and you go, oh yeah, I kind of have said no to things. I kind of have stopped initiating. Then we can take that to the Lord and say, Lord, this is the way I'm coping. Help me know what to do next. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that aspect of community. Uh, because in community can come a lot of more hurts as well. It's not just the healing process, which is necessary, but how should people who are going through grief interact with people? How much should they share? How much should they uh, receive back from other people? Because sometimes it, you can mention from your own experiences here in the book that sometimes the the things that they say meaning well don't go over well. Mm-hmm. Well, there's two sides of this that you can talk about. You can talk to the person who has an opportunity to say something to someone who is grieving. For example, if you're going to a funeral of a loved one who has just lost somebody, um, nothing you're going to say is going to fix it. So don't put that pressure on yourself. Sometimes people think that when they show up, they have to be the one who's going to give the comfort that's going to take away the pain or some of that pain and probably not going to happen. And that's okay. You don't have to fix it, but you can be with them. Um, On the other end of it, Ashley and I found it powerful to ask for what we need. And man, that's vulnerable. Like if you just need somebody to listen, asking somebody to listen can be difficult because you're not asking them to problem solve or to necessarily do anything or a task. And people often want to do tasks. They want to bring food. They want to do something. They want to run errands for you because it feels nice and neat. But to just sit with you and to listen, that's the uncomfortable space that people don't know what to do with. And I think one of the phrases that people might say could be something like God's got this and to a grieving person that might sound like God did this. And so we could do that with a lot of different phrases that people might say. Um, but understanding if you're grieving, you might hear things different than they were intended. So for one thing, try to give grace for yourself for interpreting things in a more painful way but give grace to the person like they're trying to help, but it's also okay to tell them like, that actually doesn't settle well with me. That hurts my feelings. Or or are you saying that you feel like God did this? And, and mostly I didn't say those things. I just took them to the Lord, processed them, (laughs) forgave the person, tried not to hold on to it. Some some grace. Yeah. Yeah. But it did make me not want to talk about my grief because I felt people would frequently say a spiritual answer. They would say something, you know, like God's got a plan, which to a grieving person sounds like you're saying God did this to, to you. And he, he wanted your babies to pass away because he has some bigger plan. And I think that's not necessarily what they truly intend, but it just makes the grieving person feel a little bit of shame. You know, like I'm not strong enough. I should just be able to jump onto God's plan, be happy, not feel this pain and just move on and make them more comfortable if you did that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that the whole grief topic can be hard. And so again, people don't always know what to say. So they say nothing. I've done that myself. Like, oh, what if they're having a good day? I don't want to upset them by bringing up this topic. And I've learned, okay, just try to push yourself to say something anyway. And even if you just say, hey, I love you, then that can be better than anything, better than nothing. But even that wasn't enough for me. I felt like I had a couple of times where families were like, how are you doing? And I didn't take that to mean, how are you doing in your grief? So if you have a loved one who is grieving, 
they probably need you and may not even always want you to bring up the issue. So pushing yourself to be that stable, comforting person is really powerful. And then if you're the grieving person to know it's okay if you feel a little bit less stable, but you still need people now very much. Yeah, we're talking about the other side of it, the other relationship, the other people in our community who are reacting to us who we when we might be grieving or our listeners who might be grieving um, or someone we love who might be going through some grief. I know I've, I have this tendency to not want to bring up the subject, uh, not want to talk about it because I don't want to throw salt in the wounds. But really, they need community to address their, their concerns, to listen. And sometimes there's a timidness, I think, for those who aren't grieving on how to approach those. So there's sort of a, a dividing line. You're on this side of the room, we're going to have all the people that are grieving. On the other side of the room, we're going to have the people who are doing well and mm. don't want to fix because it's going to cause a, a, a cataclysmic reaction. Mm. That's a good point. I, I can recall a student that I had who had been self-injuring, and I just got down beside him one day and said, what's this? And he paused, and he looked at me, and he said, these have been there for like a month or something. He's like you're the first person that said anything. And, and I have just held that inside of me and used that as a motivator to say, I am not going to be like everyone else. If everyone else is going to be quiet and I'm going to try to push people to be more vocal because that's what I needed. I needed people to say something. And yes, people said things wrong. And even I had hesitancy about sharing the wrong things that people said in the book because I'm like, oh, everyone's going to read it. <laughs> like, I'm not saying anything because I'm going to say the wrong thing. But I still believe it's better that we ask and someone is like, oh, I don't want to talk about it today than to never ask. So if we're trying to make that decision, do I say something to someone who may not need it or may not want it? Oh, uh, I think go ahead, but we just have to train ourselves to get the practice in to say, how do I do this well? And I find asking questions is really helpful. So, Hey, I was just thinking about you when I read this verse and it says the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And I just wanted to let you know that I was praying for you. Is there anything I can pray for you? That might be a text that I would send someone, or I just called and like, Hey, I was just thinking about you. How have you been this month? I know that there's been a lot of things going on. So I may not specifically say it, but I try to at least set them up to say, I see you. And so again, I've found that I don't regret asking those questions, but I still sometimes will have a hard time pushing myself to ask the question. And when you talk about the sort of um, experiences that you've been through, our listeners might be responding so well you've already worked through the processes of grief you've been able to write it down you've been able to go on shows like this and talk about it i'm not there yet for anyone who is in the middle of it and uh is not able to articulate it, what sort of advice do you have for them hmm. it's okay that you don't feel like you've moved to a point that maybe you're thinking you're supposed to be at and a lot of times we put pressure on ourselves that we either come up with in our mind or maybe what we think society would be comfortable with if we were to a further point. So if you lost somebody, if you lost a spouse, let's just take that for example, the fact that it still hurts and you're not past it or haven't moved on, that's okay. When you lose somebody or something that you really loved, it changes you. It changes you and life's going to look different and you have things to figure out and be patient with yourself but also make plans for what it looks like to take steps to continue to, to be healthy and to have community. And it doesn't have to be on someone else's timetable, but you can be curious about it and have conversations with people. And you say that, well, I'm not quite there yet. Well, what would it look like for you to be a little bit more healthy if that's what you're going for? If you were going to have more community, what would that look like? Well, I haven't been to church in probably two or three months. Okay. When do you think you'd like to be able to go back next week? Oh, that's too soon. Okay. Well, let's make a calendar reminder and let's think about three weeks from now. You say that I may not even go into the building, but I'm going to pull up in the parking lot and I'm going to be there for a minute and kind of just take that step. So not putting too much pressure on yourself that you have to have everything figured out for what that looks like, but not leaving it alone because that wound uh, needs to be looked at and it needs to be taken care of. And even going a little bit deeper there, if you don't want to go to church, 
now, what will be different in three weeks mm. that will make you suddenly want to go? People say time heals, but it's what we do with our time that allows us to heal. So if there's a pain that we just don't deal with for three weeks, we probably won't feel different. And so if we say, yeah, I think that if I do some of my grief processing, if I read a little bit, if I'm reading the Bible at home, then maybe that will help me because I think that going to church is going to confront me with all of the pain that I have toward God or just the sorrow. Or when I'm at church, I feel a lot more. Well, how do we bring church into our lives, right? Because church is not a building. How do we bring Jesus into our life, turn on a worship song and allow ourselves in the comfort of our own home to process with the Lord, what we're feeling. And so sometimes when we break it down and we look in, look into it a little bit more, it gives us a step that we can take before that bigger step. And so we do walk through kind of some of this mm -hmm. in the book. And one of the things is this positive and negative space. People get in a negative space, they think differently. So if you're grieving and you're not ready, having someone help you get out of that negative space can help. And so we do some exercises and worksheets and such with clients and help them to process. And I think that that uh, that gives people a lift from the the heaviness that they experience and can help them maybe take a step forward. I know a lot of people, they deny that they're in grief. They don't even want to acknowledge it. They just want to sweep it under the rug. They don't want to uh, deal with it head on. What are some of the red flags that people are actually processing grief and dealing with grief when they're in self-denial? Yeah, I think that there are a lot of ways that we handle grief in negative ways. And this is what we see a lot of times. We we deny that it even happens. Don't even want to talk about the person. I just want to barrel through and just ignore it. And I think that we can find ourselves then feeling very frustrated. And we may say, if I'm frustrated about the miscarriage, then I'm talking to Chuck and I am short with him because I'm I'm hurting and I'm upset. And so I'm displacing my frustration on to Chuck. And, and people do this at work, with their kids, with the dog. We displace our aggression to a safer place because we don't know that we know how to deal with it head on. And so we, we just, it kind of oozes is out of us. And so I think that it's important that we deal with grief or else grief might deal with us, deal with us whenever we're not quite ready for it. And I do believe that just processing and healing little by little is super powerful. We don't always see the, the positive change that we make, but we can often see that negative change as well. And it often erupts as anger. We'll have an anger wall. We put up our defenses and we don't let people in, but we're letting out this anger, which makes us feel more powerful in the short term, but it oftentimes will break down those relationships in the long term. I like to say that people very rarely say what they mean or mean what they say, especially when it comes to something hurtful or painful. Uh, it's too vulnerable to tell you what they're really upset about. So they'll make up something small. They'll, they'll react to something small as a means of expressing their their deeper emotions. Uh, but we have to be a little more conscientious of it and know that especially on, if we're on the receiving end of their anger, that they're probably processing grief. So what advice do you have for some of our listeners who maybe have a spouse who is suffering through grief or a loved one, a family member, or a neighbor, or someone in the church that is really just grieving? What advice do you have for them on how to approach those relationships? Okay. So one of the things you said, you know, was like, they might feel mad at this little small thing. I think that's a really good point that we, we can learn for ourselves. Like, oh, okay. I'm upset about the water that I just can't get to turn off. I can't get the faucet to turn off. And like, what am I really mad about? So if we ask ourselves that, like, what am I really upset about? What's that deeper feeling? I think that can be helpful. So to the family member or to the friend, if we try to see that as a possible sign of grief, right? They're normally not so like aggressive with the faucet. What could be going on? If we ask them, you know, is there anything else that you're upset about that could help them to go a little bit deeper? And sometimes people aren't ready. So it's okay if you ask and they aren't ready to talk about it, but that might be something that they reflect upon. But for all of us, it's good for us to realize maybe I'm not really mad about the thing that I'm expressing a lot of aggression on. If that's a, a car that's going too fast or too slow for us, you know, whatever the things are, you know, if we notice that we're aggressive or we're frustrated, there might be some underneath emotions that are worth looking at. And starting with yourself, because self-awareness is a superpower. 
It really is. Because if you do the work to practice and recognize why you're really angry or upset about something, that will help you to recognize it in yourself. And then when someone else is angry, you've already practiced this on yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't really mad about that. I was upset because I miss someone that I used to really care about. Or maybe if you were dating somebody and you just recently had a breakup and you're at work one day and a project is going awry and you're in a meeting and you raise your voice and blow up on somebody. It's like, you don't care that much about the project. You're upset because you used to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and now you don't. And you're worried you're going to be lonely for a long time. So the project doesn't go right and you yell at somebody. So doing that work is really, really powerful. I mean, being self-aware is practice for so much more in life. And the the approach that actually Ashley and I take in this book is very relational. It's relational because there's grief that happens in relationships, um, relationship with ourselves, relationship with God, relationship with other people and community, one on one. I mean, uh, one on one in marriage. So many different aspects of it, and we see how if you'll do the work that we we try to do every day, and we know it's hard work. We truly believe you can have better than average relationships and do more than just navigate through a loss. Because going through this, um, God uses things that are difficult oftentimes for opportunities to get better in more areas than just where the pain was. And if you lose somebody or something, developing the relationships and having the conversation can make you stronger on the other side of it. And you can recognize some areas that maybe I needed to work on my communication before this. And um, we encourage people to be involved in community all the time, not just reaching out to the church or whatever it might be in times of need. But now if someone's listening to this and they realize I don't really have a strong community or people around me, it's like, well, developing it is the right thing to do, regardless of what's going on in your life. Hmm. With that being said, Chuck, could I ask you to pray for our listeners and uh, your readers that uh, as they process through this, that uh, the grace of God and the mercies that are new every morning would become more real to them, that would offer them a peace that surpasses understanding, because these are not issues that we can deal with in our own strength. We need mm -hmm. something of God's love and strength and mercy to be able to process who we used to be and who we are now. Absolutely. I'd love to. Lord, we, we come before you and we recognize how you are so loving and so caring towards us. You see us in the moments of our deepest, lowest grief and loss and processing. How are we going to continue to move forward? But God, you see us. You're in every moment and every time. Lord, as people are processing and thinking about how their life used to be something different, they used to have an identity that's different, and maybe they have an unwanted title. I ask that we'd be able to continue to give this to you and find our identity in you, that you make us stronger. Lord, you give us resourcefulness. You give us community. You give us your word that speaks to us every single day. I pray that people's hearts, minds, and communities would be drawn towards you and they'd find peace. They'd find comfort. They'd know that you see them and you love them every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We've been talking with Chuck and Ashley Elliott. Their book is called, I Used to Be, Fill in the Blank, uh, How to Navigate Large and Small Losses in Life and Find Your Path Forward. A great resource and one, quite honestly, that I know hits each and every one of us. If this is a resource that you can benefit from, I encourage you to get a copy to read the book. But there are also other resources that Chuck and Ashley have, uh, many more, as well as a website. What is your website if people wanted to find you? Yeah, it's chuckandashley.com, and you can find online courses, devotionals, various different things on there that we do just to help people in relationships. Again, I can't thank you enough. It's a great resource for us to, to share with our listeners, and I know that many of them are challenged by where they're at in life, where they used to be, and where they currently are. So a great resource. Again, thank you so much for being a part of the many voices for that one message. Thanks so much for having us.